It's our privilege to study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and we have extra copies. If you didn't bring one with you and you'd like one to follow along, uh, just raise your hand up real high. Someone will make sure to drop one off at your row, your aisle. Anybody at all need a copy? We'll be going through the middle section of uh, John's Gospel, chapter 12. We've been calling this the Gospel of Glory, and um, that's just been sort of one of those things you recognize about a book after you read it through. There are four Gospel accounts, four records according to different people. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the Synoptic Gospels. Then we have John's Gospel, which really stands out in a in a several different ways, one of which is the use of this term glory. And we just sang it, glory be to God the Father, glory be to the Son. And we, we sing this over and over again. You've probably heard the word uh, if you've been around church at all. What, is it, what does it mean? Is it, is it one of those words that we just sort of use as a filler, or does it mean something? I think that's great for us to take a look at, given the passage we're going to be studying today. Is, uh, is glory the same thing as fame or renown or prestige? Is it is it like popularity or, or is it notoriety? Is glory receiving uh, applause for winning something or accolades for achieving or accomplishing something? Uh, in biblical terms, the, the word that's translated as glory, uh, in the Old Testament we have the word kebad, which means importance, weightiness, but it's broad and it has a range of meaning. It can also mean wealth or power or honor, also visible splendor. And this is what it has in common with the Greek word in the New Testament and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which uh, was, given, uh, was, was uh, put together around the 3rd century B.C. by a bunch of Jewish scholars, and they used doxa, uh, when they translated kebod, they used this word doxa. Uh, in John's gospel, we have the noun form doxa and its glory. And then we have the verb form as well, doxadzo. And in John's gospel alone, 42 times some form of that word is there. And in this particular section that we're in now is chapter 12, through chapter 17 describing the Passion Week itself, it's fascinating to me that over half of the uses of this doxa or doxadzo, over half of the uses in John's Gospel are all within this week leading up to the cross. And it's almost as if John is highlighting and pointing to us that there is glory in the cross. There's a glory that God receives and is due and that is manifest and that he puts on full display for the world to see. And it's the glory of the cross. As the narrative begins to describe the events nearer to Jesus' death, uh, I'll try to highlight that as we go along. We'll see five of the uses of that word just in the passage that we'll be looking at today, which will be verses 12 through 36. If you'll turn there in your Bibles, nowhere can there be seen such honor than in the humiliation of the cross. Nowhere can there be seen such splendor as in the vindication of the resurrection of Jesus. And these together, these two events together, describe the glorification of Jesus along with the exaltation when he ascends back on high. And if you want to continue on to include uh, even greater glory and, and increased glory and progressive glory, much more so when he comes back to set all things right in the consummation of his kingdom, which the Bible talks about as well. So we look forward to that as well, the glory of the cross. There's glory in the resurrection, there's glory in the ascension, and there's glory to be seen in his return as well. So turn with me, if you will. It is Passover week, and as we studied last week, um, Jesus has come to Bethany and then is moving uh, today, as we pick up in verse 12, he's moving to what would, in the other synoptics, we, or in the synoptics rather, we would call the Palm Sunday uh, trip where he goes into Jerusalem from Bethany. So this is John's account of it. He's not quite as concerned with some of the details that Matthew, Mark, and Luke include, but he does want to include it. And so we read, on the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, this is the Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of the palm trees. They went out to meet him, and they began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And so they're, they're lifting from uh, Psalm 118, very much known to have been a reference to the Messiah, God's promised Redeemer King that God would send to redeem and rescue Israel, God's people. Um, some of the, m many of the Jews at that time thought of the Messiah as that he would come as a political 
deliverer, or as an economic or sociological deliverer. And indeed, even in our own day and time, some people think those are the three most important categories in the world. But they really aren't. The human problem is actually deeper than all of that. It's in the human heart. What we need is someone who can come and save us. The Lord is my salvation. We just sang it. He's our Savior, not just in the sweet by and by for that last, you know, right before Judgment Day, but even now we're experiencing his salvation and his abundant life that he offers to us. So they sing with their, their knowledge, their understanding of thinking that he's coming to save them from the Roman oppressive you know, regime that's, that's, that's uh, occupying their territory and ruling in the Roman Empire because that's the political context on the ground at the time. They sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel, hoping Jesus will come in to Jerusalem and run out the Romans. Jesus, finding a young donkey, verse 14, sat on it as, as it is written... And here's John connecting again the Old Testament for us. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. And there he is quoting from Zechariah 9.9, a, a passage that would have indeed been familiar to most Jews of the time. They spent a lot of time memorizing scripture. They understood uh, what Zechariah was talking about, that there would be a king who would come and bring peace at some time. But they didn't necessarily themselves think that when the Messiah showed up, he would come in peace on a donkey like this. And so Jesus uses a mnemonic device, that is, he rides on a donkey, which is this, this, this young colt, this, this uh, uh, instead of a war horse, he's not coming and saying like, like if he were uh, coming to do battle in a militaristic way or some kind of nationalistic hero who's going to set Israel free politic. No, he comes in peace to bring the peace of God, to bring the salvation of God. And he comes to, within humility, we're even told here, which is amazing. And he's just, when you read Zechariah 9, the, the characteristics of this king that is promised is that he's just, that he's righteous. Man, that's, that's an awesome and needed character quality trait for those who would lead at all in any category, whether they're political or religious or, or economic or educational, whatever it might be. Very important. And so there is this sort of mixture of things, the Messianic Psalm, the, prof the prophecy from Zechariah that the people are kind of picking up on. And here he comes riding on a donkey. So somebody remembers, oh yeah, Zechariah talks about that. And they start shouting that as well. These things his disciples did not understand at first. You see, even the disciples of Jesus have been walking with him for three years, and they didn't connect the dots themselves. John is reflecting back, and he remembers on that day. We didn't remember this. He says, even his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, oh, there's that word, dux, duxadzo, that verb. And you can underline if you want. I'll show you five times that it's used here. But when Jesus was glorified, in other words, after his death... After his resurrection, after his ascension, John looking back on all of that in time as he's writing this. When he was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. The crowd had waved their palms and received him as if he were king. And so the multitude who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, and this is another subgroup that are on the road that day, or perhaps this is even a day later, we're not really told, but the multitude who were with him when he raised Lazarus from the tomb bearing, were bearing witness of him. For this cause also the multitude went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So whether they, were, went, they went to meet him on the road as he came in to Jerusalem that Palm Sunday or went, whether they went to meet him when, they, when he was teaching, as we know he did, he'll come in and out from Bethany and back and forth to Jerusalem. Uh, as the folks were coming because they saw or they heard about him raising Lazarus from the dead. They're coming uh, because he had performed this sign. And then there's another group, verse 19, the Pharisees, and that's where we usually go, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. They're huddling up is what's happening here. They're pulling a circle together. The city is so full. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, suggests that some Passovers had as many as two million people showing up in Jerusalem. Do you understand? That's a lot of people. That is, that, is a, that is a highway full of people. That is every campfire space on the hillside is full. So it is jam-packed 
with people coming into the city during the Passover time. And the Pharisees are so upset about the fact that Jesus has attracted crowds. If people are shouting Hosanna as he who comes in the name, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're upset about all that. They form a huddle, verse 19 says, the, the bunch of them, you can just see them getting out. I mean, man, you know, when, the, when it's six to two, <laughs> it's time to form a huddle. Some of you were watching last night, weren't you? Yeah. It's time to get a little huddle going, man. It's time to... And so the Pharisees huddle up. And they're going, what are we doing here? What are we going to do here? You know? Look, the world has gone after him, they say. And I say, awesome. They're going after Jesus. They're coming to Jesus. Oh, that my heart would be so eager all the time. Uh, Oh, that I'd take every palm branch I can find and lay it down in front of him and receive and welcome this king who approaches my heart every single day uh, that I might rejoice in him that I might uh, receive the life he continues to want to give to me each and every day um, now, it's fascinating to me because this, this passage we're studying today is kind of a patchwork. It's, it, they're, they're different groups, the multitudes, a subset of the multitudes that were around when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The disciples have been mentioned. And now a completely different group is mentioned in verse 20. There were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. That would be the northern third of Israel. And they began to ask him, Philip, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I love to underline phrases that, to me, will preach. You know, preachers always do that. That'll preach. We wish to see Jesus. We could camp out there for a couple of weeks. What do you wish for? What do you wish for as it relates to Jesus? Which Jesus do you want to see? You know, what kind of Jesus? And these guys, some of them seeking a political Jesus. Some of them thinking about an economic Jesus. Some of them thinking about a religious uh, rule-following type Jesus. Pharisees would certainly be religious rule-followers. But here come some Greeks. These are not Jews. They might be among those that are often called by New Testament scholars God-fearers. That is... Gentiles who are so tired of the nonsense and the philosophical short-circuiting of the, of the mindset of a sort of nature gods, that we worship nature gods, and there are many of them, that there's a, a god of the sun and of the moon and of the stars, a god of the trees, a god of the chair you're sitting on, a god of the floor planks in the building here, a god of gravity, a god of rain, a god of you know, the rivers, a God of the ocean, all those different kind of nature deities, none of which are really supreme because their job is defining them. And yet when the Bible speaks about God, the reference is to an almighty sovereign, which means he's Lord of all. He's completely other. There's no other, there's nothing in that category besides God. You could draw a line. God is on that side. Everything else that exists is on the other side. Because God is the creator, sustainer, ruler of everything. And everything else is created, sustained, and ruled by him. And so here it seems like these Greeks are tired or weary of their pantheistic, you know, their their nature God system. And, and there, were, there were Roman versions of that as well as Greek versions of that. And they've become these kind of interested Gentiles that would make, take the time, spend the money, and make the trip to Jerusalem for that really important festival. And some of them might just be there for the party. That's true. We have to be open. It's not, a, it's not just sort of one reason that they're all there. Some of them may have come because it's Mardi Gras in Jerusalem. And they think of it that way. Let's go. I heard there's like two million people there, you know. And that ought to be fun. Let's go, you know. And, and so they go. And, but some of them have come to worship, it says right here in verse 20, at the feast. Isn't that interesting? They're doing what the Pharisees ought to be doing. And the Pharisees are not doing. And as a matter of fact, the Pharisees have murder on their minds. We've already been told that. So sometimes as you read through the Bible, you find faith where you don't expect to find it, and you don't find faith where you expect to find it. 
That happens over and over again. Here the Greeks are among those who come to the feet. They look up Philip. By the way, Philip and Andrew are the two disciples that have Greek names. So the Greeks look up the two disciples of Jesus that happen to have Greek names. Now, how do they know this? that his name was Philip and his name was Andrew? Hi, my name is Andrew. Did they have that? I don't, I don't know. Maybe they heard someone say, hey, Andrew, hey, Philip, whatever. That can happen in close quarters. Remember, there's two million or close to two million people there. It's really crowded. Um, so Philip came and told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus together. And Jesus answered them. And this is, this is interesting. Verse 23. Look at that. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Do you understand? That's a huge shift. Why? Because heretofore he's been saying, my hour is not yet come, or has not yet come. My day has not yet come. And now he says, this is it. It's time. Who's in charge of the timing of Jesus laying down his life? Jesus is the Father. The God, the Trinitarian God is. Okay? It's not that, oh, those pesky religious leaders got one over on him or the devil got one over on him, or the Romans got one over him. No, he's in charge of pacing this whole thing. He's the one that went out to the wilderness to avoid the, the rap, you know, speeding things up. He's the one that has come back now and chosen to make this his hour. The hour has come for the Son of Man, his most often used self-reference title, the Son of Man. And he goes on, truly, truly, that couplet, which he uses probably two dozen times in John's Gospel, as if to say, this is really True. In other words, I really mean this. Verily, verily. Amen, amen. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat... And this is so fascinating. Look at this. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Isn't that paradoxical? Yeah. Here's another one. He who loves his life loses it. That's a paradox. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. That's another paradox. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If you serve, you get honored. There's a paradox. Listen, the Christian faith is filled with paradox. If you don't like paradox, do not. (laughs) Or let me put it this way. You won't like the Christian faith. It's filled with paradox. The first become last. The last become first. If you want to find your life, you've got to give it away. You got to give it back to the one who gave it to you. Um, this is glory in action. That's what paradox sort of does. That's just sort of the fruit of, fruit of it is that where you're sort of surprised and all of a sudden there's some splendor and all of a sudden it becomes visible in people's lives. There's glory at work here. My soul now has become troubled, verse 27. And what, I, what shall I say? He's speaking out loud, thinking out loud a little bit. And he says, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So you see a little bit of what's going on inside of Jesus' own heart and his humanity. Sort of that tearing back and forth that we all experience. You have a Savior that knows what that means. To be torn a little bit back and forth. And then he says, Father, in an out loud prayer that others hear, Father, glorify doxazo glorify the verb glorify your name and then John the one who was so close to Jesus an eyewitness of Jesus a close disciple of Jesus says there came therefore a voice out of heaven and I'm pretty sure John would have been there to hear it himself the voice out of heaven says this I have both glorified it doxazo And I will glorify Doxadzo. I will do it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered, this audible voice of God from the heavens. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus, seeing all this, answered and said this, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Judgment is upon this world now. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. In other words, this moment, this hour of mine that has come is a complete pivot point. It's a huge pivot point for all of humanity and for all of redemption history. 
And I, he says, verse 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And then John, his good friend, adds a little bit of helping us understand it, uh, what Jesus just said. He said he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. What kind of death was that? Crucifixion. He would be lifted up, much like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Jesus would be lifted up. And those who gaze past, cast their gaze upon him, cast their faith, their trust, their hope, their confidence in him would be saved. That's exactly a great picture, exactly, of what's being offered. The multitude, therefore, uh, answered him. They said, we've heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Okay, their curiosity is a little bit aroused here. They're used to thinking in terms of what the Old Testament says about the, 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 the sort of shoot of Jesse that would come, the, the one that would be one of David's descendants, that would, God would establish his throne forever. And so they're connecting that a little bit with this moment. How is it that you say then, this son of man uh, should be lifted up like this or die. They didn't get what Isaiah was talking about, but they did get some of the other stuff. For a little, little while longer, Jesus says, verse 35 is amazing. For a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light. That darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light in order that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he departed and hid himself from them. Again, he is in charge of what's going on. Just three things I want to highlight for you out of this text. Kind of a patchwork uh, quilt of a text. As I know, there are a couple different pericopes or small narrative units within this larger, you know, verses 12 through 36. You know, the Palm Sunday thing, we have that. We have the, the, the teaching by Jesus. But it begins with this Palm Sunday account from John where the Prince of Glory is, is on full display. The people even get it. They connect Jesus' approach to Jerusalem with the, with the notion that he might be the king that God promised, the deliverer king. And so they sing Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he who is the king of Israel. And they also reference Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice great, o da- greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, having salvation, is he humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so this is amazing. The prince of glory, the one who, for, for all of our interest in glory, and, and, and I got to tell you, you know, I could use the word glory, if you don't mind, to to, to really describe what happens to every single one of us, whether we're believers or not. There's something about glory that haunts us, that draws us in. Now, it, 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 virtually every human person, the New Testament claims, can, can see what's going on in creation or experience what's going on in creation and has that nagging sense that there's more than can be perceived with the empirical senses. There's more to life than what can be seen on our microscope or can be seen in a telescope or can be explained by the sciences. Um, Things like honor, things like love, things like forgiveness. What are those things? Where do they come from? How is it that we're drawn to more than what we can control or what we can actually experience in the physical, with the physical senses? And that's this, we're haunted by glory. God has put eternity in our hearts, is the way the book of Ecclesiastes says it. And so every single one of us finds ourselves completely unsatisfied for most of our life by most of what we experience in the physical realm. We just go, wow, for a moment that was pleasurable, but why, why is it still leaving me wanting more? How come that's the case? And how much is enough? And the answer seems to be always just a little bit more, doesn't it? We're chronically dissatisfied. Why is that? I think the hound of heaven is haunting us. And we were designed to not only see his glory, but to experience his glory. We were designed, as the Westminster Catechism would put it, to glorify God. That's what we were actually designed to do. And when we begin to understand that, begin to respond to him by 
by doxadza, by, by actually glorifying him, uh, then all of a sudden we're doing what we were designed to do. Here he is, the prince of glory. From King's Cross, Keller says, Jesus doesn't point to the glory of God as Elijah, Moses, and other prophets have done. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. That's so true. Here also we see the paradox of glory, as I said earlier. It's the death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus that begin to unfold what is meant by his glory being revealed. The disciples didn't understand, we were told, in verse 16. The disciples didn't understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. It made sense then. So cross, resurrection... Ascension, this process that, that, in, that begins with the cross of, of Jesus being glorified, his hour coming, and this unfolding process of his glorification. So we might begin to actually connect all the dots like these disciples start to do. The glory of the gospel is that when we start to get it, there's this paradox, is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. That's so true. So how then, Village Chapel, how are we different from the watching world? Have we just fallen into the flow of the way everybody else thinks? Or do we find ourselves occasionally in the minority view on some things? Have we just fallen into the flow of the, of the way so many people are experiencing the chaos of our world? And, and we're drowning in it too, drowning in the despair of it? Or the anger of it? Is that us too? Or are we somehow or another different because we actually trust someone other than, than our human leaders? Do we somehow or another find ourselves content because we're confident in God? Is that possible in this world? Do we somehow, somehow or another find ourselves even joyful even though we're suffering? You know, we had, we had a couple ladies at the, at the women's retreat that, that hurt themselves. Uh, one slipped and fell, hurt her wrist, had to have surgery. The other uh, banged her head on the concrete and went to the hospital. On the, and I got an email describing her trip to the hospital. And all, the, all through the whole trip to the hospital and back to the retreat, her concern was, how do I share the contentment of the gospel with everybody I come into contact with at the hospital? See, and, and most people just, yeah, we, we chuckled a little, but that's glory on the move, man. That's God's glory on the move in somebody's life. That their suffering, that knot on their head, all of a sudden becomes a glory knot. What's your glory knot? A part of your life is bound up in knots. And God's just waiting to turn it into some kind of glory moment or some kind of device for his glory. We need to be different from the way the watching world is. The watching world, uh, so demanding, so angry, so confused, so many ways, despairing in every way. Are we, are we just, do we look just like them or are we different because we're the people of God? Andrew Xi uh, uh, was a Chinese evangelist. He founded uh, Evangelized China Fellowship. Uh, first part of the uh, 20th century. He says, God's time for revival is in the very darkest hour. When everything seems hopeless, it is always the Lord's way to go to the very worst cases to manifest his glory. Oh, oh that's worth marinating in, isn't it? Yeah. Some of us need to write that down and hang that on the wall. And look at that. You see, you see this gospel of glory will transform even your suffering. It, it, you know, it will transform even the part of life that you think is falling apart or isn't attractive or isn't good or whatever. Well, how do I know that? Well, because Jesus didn't sidestep the cross. And his glorification is wrapped up in that cross. As he moves toward the cross, we keep hearing John say, glory, 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 more and more and more, driving it home that Jesus is going to be glorified because of what he does at the cross. Thirdly and finally, the people of glory. I think verses 35 to 36. Look, look at it again with me, will you? 35 and 36 of chapter 12 there. Just beautiful what Jesus says there. He says, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. 
He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light in order that you may become sons or children of the light. And he's already said, I am the light of the world. He's already made it clear what he means by that. Not just that he points to the light, not that just that he can turn on the light, not just that you know, he knows where there's some light. He is the light. So we believe in him. We trust and hope in him, see? And then we become children of the light. Our problem, as Tozer said, is that we go from toy to toy rather than from glory to glory. If Tozer were alive today, maybe he would have said, our problem is that we go from device to device rather than from glory to glory. Or he might have said that we go from money to money, from job to job, from opportunity to opportunity, from this lover to that lover. We go from this partner to that partner. We go from this identity to that identity instead of from glory to glory. There's so many things that he could have said there, but in 1963, he passed away a long time ago, and yet this is incredibly profound as I look at it. What are you substituting in to your life with your affections set in the direction of some toy or some, something other than God's glory? Experiencing, knowing, exalting Him. Turning it, not only, not only the noun form, but the verb, found, for, verb form as well. <clears throat> Experiencing His glory, the noun, and glorifying Him in all that you do. C.S. Lewis and Reflections on the psalm said the scotch catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify god and enjoy him forever but we shall then know that these are the same thing fully to enjoy is to glorify and commanding us to glorify him god is inviting us to enjoy him that's the invitation on offer today is that you might learn to delight in god this god this one who delights in you so much so that he came when you were running away from him, when I was running away from him, when I was turned the other way, when I was in rebellion, open rebellion against him, he came for me. And he died on the cross for my sins so that I could be reconciled to a holy and righteous God. That's one of the reasons we're coming to this table today is because we acknowledge all of that. We're sinners. We need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. Jesus has come. He's our Savior. We come to say thank you up here. Uh, his body was broken. His blood was shed for us. And we must give thanks. As C.S. Lewis would later say, the, 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 the complete experience is when we get to the place where we actually are thankful for the experience. And that's why I love our first Sundays of each month. We come to say thank you to our Father who has given us this great gift of salvation through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I'll close with this last lengthy but good Keller quote from Walking with God Through Suffering. It fits to glorify God. It not only fits reality because God is infinitely, supremely praiseworthy, but it fits us as nothing else does. All the beauty we have looked for in art, faces, places, all the love we have looked for from the arms of other people is only fully present in God himself. And so in every action by which we treat him as glorious as he is, whether through prayer, singing, trusting, obeying, hoping, we are at once giving God his due and fulfilling our own design. Let's give God his due and for fulfill our own design as we come to the table. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this passage. Uh, Thank you for planting within us the capacity to see, to know, to experience you and your glory. Um, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to haunt each and every one of us uh, so much so that we, we, we finally turn to you and, and, and we ultimately uh, receive from you this, uh, this abundant life, this salvation that you so eagerly desired to give to each and every person. Let us know the reality um, of the fact that you've paid the price once for all for my sin, for our sins, Lord. 
Set each and every one of us free. Holy Spirit, move among us in this moment that we might know you, that we might love you, redirect our affections, uh, reorder our desires, Lord, that we might live for your glory and fulfill not only um, your desire for us, but your design for us too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.